Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ 455 to 463, part 3 of 3. In parts 1 and 2, we covered Harvey Jackins and Edmund Burglar's perspective on anxiety. Uh, now I'll just maybe review some of the jargon uh, from those two videos. TQ 455. Neurosis. Any psychological disturbance or syndrome or both arising as a reaction to stress. Synonymous with psychoneurosis. So just again, generally, whenever the word neurosis or neurotic is being used, nowadays we say dysfunction or dysfunctional or self-defeating behavior, or self-sabotaging behavior, or anything dysfunctional. When we talk about something being dysfunctional, the inference there is that it's due to a developmental trauma. So dur during the early stages of development, there may have been a lot of, the child may have acquired a lot of stress, maybe the double bind of a situation, um, or the child continuously not getting his needs met uh, or the continuous misattunement uh, you name it anything that goes awry during development whereby the frustrating memories with the mother outweigh the positive memories that's a developmental trauma so then whatever uh, whatever defense mechanisms we acquire in any personality style around those defense mechanisms, uh, okay, so leading to someone being dysfunctional and whatnot, we say it's due to a developmental stress, uh, it's a, a psychological stress. Because it's a developmental stress, we say it's a psychological, uh, it's psychologically based, or sometimes called a psychoneurosis. To distinguish it from Traumatic neurosis, a psychoneurotic reaction to physical injury. So if somebody's dysfunctional because of a situational trauma, as opposed to a developmental trauma, we can say traumatic neurosis. I think now we say PTSD, more specifically focused on a situational trauma. Right. So somebody's dysfunctional because of a developmental trauma, we just say uh, he's neurotic or or that, he, or that uh, we just generally say he's neurotic. But if we want to say that he, the reason he's neurotic is due to a situational uh, trauma, we then say uh, PTSD or traumatic neurosis. Now, if they're combined somehow, TQ457, the traumatic neurosis syndrome may be viewed as a fundamental, non-specific organismic reaction to severe external stress. Psychological and physiological alarm mechanisms are set into action but are not appropriately discharged. Free-floating anxiety and continuing tension result. So it seems in the past if we want to talk about anxiety due to both developmental trauma and situational trauma, I think they use this phrase, the traumatic neurosis syndrome. I'm not sure what phrase is being used now. We have PTSD, meaning situational uh, shock, trauma, and we just say uh, someone's being dysfunctional due to a developmental trauma. Uh, but we don't really seem to have a term to, that captures both. But in the past, we have a term. Um, in general, whether there's a developmental trauma or a situational trauma, there's the compulsion to repeat the situation in order to master the trauma. And in the attempt, in the process of repeating it, uh, there's anxiety related to that. Anxiety is fear in the absence of a known cause. Okay. So, um, as mentioned in part two, one theory was that uh, the cause could have been the deep uh, memory 
uh, of the mother threatening to leave the person when they were a child. But that deep memory is the unknown cause. Uh, anxiety is related to the defense against that deep memory. You see, so Burglar calls that leading versus misleading. If you think you're anxious because of something related to your defense mechanism, that's misleading. You have to look underneath the defense mechanism, the dysfunctional behavior, and look underneath it to the root cause, which would, which would be, according to one author, the memory, the unconscious memory of the mother threatening to abandon the, ch the child. Right? So these uh, unconscious, uh, unknown reasons for anxiety, maybe sometimes they're called ghosts. A ghost is a manifestation of guilt, a memory contested, so in the anxiety, a memory is being contested, a memory is being brought up, right? Now in both cases, in developmental trauma and situational trauma, um, we, we, we can sometimes say there's arrested development, and with that phrase we sometimes say there's a fixation. Or 60, fixation, any life force, when life force firmly attaches itself onto a person or an imago connected to developmental arrest and or trauma, often regressive in nature, obtaining an archaic mode of satisfaction. In the compulsion to repeat, the subject has no access to an unconscious wish. So there again, uh, it's reference to that. In the compulsion to repeat, the person has no access to the unconscious wish. Burglar says, your anxiety is related to your defenses against the unconscious wish. So there's that layered aspect to it. So the idea here again is um, when there's arrested development, okay, the life force is attached to the image of the rejecting mother. Okay. And uh, Robert Bly says, the goal is to get the key out from under mother's pillow, to deconfect from the rejecting image and to connect to the self image that's the plumb line to the self right and we do that through the morning process uh, in general the term fixation can be used to signify a hang-up quote in the processes of change that follow any major change in adult life including a loss thus a person who goes on grieving beyond the expected period can be said to be fixated. So there again, it's just a general idea that when there's something that's we can't process, we're fixed to there, we're stuck there. Right. So the two theories um, to explain all of this, one is by Burglar, he has a he puts it in the following my understanding of it is as follows the baby has a wish to bond with the mother to form a secure attachment with the mother when there's an insecure attachment style or developmental trauma that gets rejected so we're talking about the insecure attachment style right so the baby has a wish that's number one it gets rejected number two the baby wants to protest but he doesn't have the motor skills so he can't that's number three number four he feels defeated all right so there's the four steps now in the repetition compulsion in repeating those four steps so now as an adult the person wants to have a real wish but he doesn't know what that is so that's vetoed the super ego says no super ego let's just say is the deep memory of those four steps so the superego says no. Okay, so that's step one and two. He doesn't know what his wish is. It got rejected. Now step three, he's going to protest. Like the baby couldn't protest, now in the repetition compulsion, he's going to want to master that. Now he's going to protest. But what does he protest? He doesn't know. But in steps one and two, life force got mixed in with the rejection. Pleasure of the life force got mixed in with the displeasure of the rejection. Now, in the protest, to the repetition compulsion gone awry, the superego is going to agree to the person doing something dysfunctional to preserve 
the repetition compulsion requirement, and the repetition compulsion includes steps one and two, where guilt has been libidinized, psychic pain, life force has been mixed in with the rejection. So that's the pleasure and displeasure principle. So it's not the case that someone doing dysfunctional is wanting to do it. He's getting some secret pleasure out of it. That's not the case. That doesn't describe it. What we're talking about here is that the baby mixed his positive life force with the rejection. Okay. In the repetition compulsion of the trauma, that gets repeated. Okay. So the person doesn't. It's not doing it to try to get some pleasure out of his displeasure. He's caught in the repetition compulsion, gone awry. Embedded within the repetition compulsion is the deep memory of the child having the pleasurable wish of wanting to bond and the displeasure of it getting mixed up with the rejection. But the, so the child blends the two. Berger calls this uh, libidinized guilt or the libidinalization of guilt or the pleasure and displeasure principle. So that gets put on that record that we carry around. Right? Um, so now as an adult, uh, step three, he's going to protest, all right, do what the baby couldn't do. But Burglar calls this pseudo-aggression because it ultimately leads to the unlived life. That's step four that the baby experienced. That the baby experienced the defeat of it all. In the repetition compulsion, in the adult version, it's the unlived life. That's Burglar's theory. Now, during the pseudo-aggression, if that's not working well, uh, there may be anxiety because that's the deal the person made with the superego that he uses this pseudo-aggression, this dysfunctional living uh, as a compromise. So Burglar says anxiety is when you don't square accounts with the superego. So the superego, okay, the deep memory of the four steps, okay, made the compromise with the person that he can Live his life, but only dysfunctionally, to preserve the memory of the four steps. And when that dysfunctional living is disrupted or is not available, or if the person is in, has the narcissistic pattern and he's not getting his supply, he'll be anxious. Right? So anxiety relates to the defense, that step three we're talking about. That's what Burglar says. And during that time, that person with the narcissistic pattern not getting his supply needs met for grandiosity and being one up and all that, he's not aware of the original situation. He's not a, he doesn't know about the four steps that the baby went through. He's not aware of it. Right. So they, they were saying here in 460, the subject has no access to an unconscious wish. We only uh, have access to uh, the frustration of the defense mechanism. So that, that was a uh, burglar's theory, uh, an abbreviated version of it. Uh, his theory in general is called psychic masochism uh, in reference to steps one and step two, where the baby's life force got mixed in with the rejection of the mother. Right. Uh, Jackins uh, has a sort of a, a more user-friendly approach to all this. I'll just read it again. 462, Harvey Jackins says, can I just uh, make sure it's still recording here? Yeah, okay. An open psychic wound is like being booby-trapped. When we are confronted by a new experience that is similar enough to the recorded distress experience, we are compulsively forced to meet it with an attempted reenactment of the old distress experience. One might say that, reminded too much of the old distress experience, we are forced to behave as if we were some kind of walking jukebox. In effect, the new experience pushes the button. The recording of the old miserable experience then rolls out as if from a rack onto a turntable in the head. The recording now plays us, the person in the grip of this recording of an old distress experience, says things that are not pertinent, does things that don't work, fails to cope with the situation, and endures terrible feelings that have nothing to do with the present. This wounded inner child of the past behavior, this is quite unlike the creative, capable behavior of an adult 
or someone who has a secure attachment style without developmental trauma or situational trauma. This distressed behavior is bad enough. It is, however, not the last of the mischief when present triggers of the past traumata. With the present triggers of the past traumata, the booby trap acquires more triggers. The net effect is that each experience of being re-stimulated or reminded too much of, in this way, leaves the person predisposed to be upset more easily by more things, more often, more deeply, and for longer periods of time. The effect is a snowballing one. Okay, so he's talking more about the, the traumatic neurosis or the PTSD. And this ends up describing or resembling developmental trauma in the end. A person with developmental trauma, the symptoms of it eventually resemble the symptoms of the traumatic neurosis, the, PT, the situational trauma. So the person is re-triggered. Uh, that new stimulus is now recorded and it's added to the, his metaphorical booby trap. So now there, are, now he has more things he's going to be upset by. Uh, because he's getting older, it's going to take longer to recover. So he's getting upset more easily by more things. It takes longer to recover. Um, and he's going to feel the pain of it uh, more deeply each time. He's getting re-stimulated. One person says neurosis is progressive. It gets worse, you know, develop, or it can, let's say, you know. Um, So again, uh, in both metaphors, in Bergler's metaphor of the record that we carry around, we project it into the present. So remember, if you haven't seen parts one and part two, Bergler has Bergler says that every neurotic carries a long playing music disc record, an LP record. Um, okay. And everywhere he goes, and, and whenever he sees a record player, he plays that record. So he's bringing the past distress experience into the present situation. And that's why, as Jackins says, he, he's, uh, he's, he's responding inappropriately. And uh, he says things he doesn't mean. And uh, he's not coping because he's living in the past in the present situation. The present is not the past. Nobody in the present represents his mother in the nursery, like for example, you know. Um, but the person, his positive intention is to master the trauma with the mother. So what he may project, uh, the rejecting image of the mother onto a non-threatening substitute and then argue with that person, but it doesn't make sense because that person isn't the mother. So there's that, someone called it a secondary delusion. Right. That's why we call the repetition compulsion gone awry. It's it's, it's uh, chaotic and all that. Um, Melanie Klein is more graphic about it. She calls the defense mechanism of splitting uh, schizoidal-like and paranoid-like. You know that to really accentuate how how much of a delusion this is. That uh, that's something the present is the same as your mother in the nursery 50 years ago. You see how, but the brain, one quote said that the amygdala, the amygdala or the unconscious doesn't know time, but it's our conscious mind that knows time. So uh, one person says that an interpretation links the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. It's the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious. So ultimately we're, tr we're hoping for integration. TQ 463. Integration, the process or result of establishing relations between parts and welding them into a functional whole. Okay, so unhappiness is a malady of the personal synthesis. Okay, we're seeking wholeness, that's integration. Integration is establishing relationships between the parts of ourselves and welding them into a functional whole. So the primary split is a representation of the other and the self to one side that, that we don't know about that's the painful memories of the mother and the painful feelings of the self representation so, okay and then we have 
split from that, the positive memories of the mother linked to a representation of the self who, who was loved and cared for. So there's a huge ambivalence towards the mother with that split. And you don't mourn when the splitting's there. You don't find a psychological birth. You don't have the real self because you're caught in that deep ambivalence. There's this constant... So in myths and fairy tales, you see the, the conflict between the good witch and the bad witch, or something, or the good fairy godmother and the bad witch, or the monster, right? So, uh, so there's this deep ambivalence related to the splitting defense mechanism. The splitting precludes mourning, and when we don't have mourning, we have what Jackins is talking about. Stress on stress, stress builds on stress, then you, then you become a curmudgeon, and you develop the symptoms of PTSD, as he's talking about here. Uh, so the, the goal to heal anxiety, we need to face that original deep ambivalence. What's that deep ambivalence? Why is it there? How did it get there? We somehow face that. That's why we talk about things and try to find interpretations which link the conscious to the unconscious. You see, we have to get to know uh, our unconscious, the unbewoosed. Remember the unconscious is that bag we drag behind us, Robert Bly talks about. By the age of five, everything about ourselves uh, that gets disassociated or denied or repressed or rejected or we can't face, we put in this bag. And then it becomes the secret self or the stranger within, the unbewoosed. Uh, someone called it the shadow soul. Someone called it your alter ego. Right. So in literature, it's called the double. So we get to know this stranger within, this double. And then we get to integrate. We, one person called it the skeleton. And he, his metaphor is, you invite the skeleton. Oh, hold on a sec. We've got a visitor here. Oh. And there he goes. Okay. <laughs> I think it may have accidentally startled him. When I move to try to get a closer look, he flies off sometimes, right? <laughs> so there's the blue jay. So when we integrate the parts, we find the blue jay. We find the bluebird of happiness, right? So the work of mourning, facing that deep ambivalence, that's the work of, uh, the byproduct of that is the blue jay of happiness. So the bluebird of happiness is there. We just have to do um, the, the work of remembering well. Someone said, the work of good morning is remembering well, right? Remembering well. Yeah. And again, we have to separate the image of ourselves out from the rejecting image of the mother, because it's kind of blurred there sometimes, right? And then, uh, and then we find the plumb line to the self. We we get the key out from under mother's pillow. Okay, we defect. And then we connect to ourselves, that's the plumb line to the self. Uh, now we have a sense of self, ontological security, basic trust. Uh, we feel at home with ourselves. Right? That's, the, that's the, the journey home. Odysseus is all about that. The whole, the whole journey with the Odyssey is for the person to find his home. Right? And uh, Odysseus had a huge split there. Right? That's why the journey was so long, they said. Yeah, we'll have more quotes on the Odyssey later on. Okay, I'll just leave it here. So this has been part three of three of TQ 455 to 463 on anxiety. So we've covered two theories on it. One by Burglar, which I think is uh, worth worth keeping in mind. Uh, I, I find it very... Uh, Burglar wrote 24 books and 300 papers. He's the second most prolific psychoanalytic author in psychoanalysis. Uh, no one knows why, no one knows why his work is not being covered. Um, but he, 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 his, uh, one person said the reason why his work is not being covered is because that insight about psychic masochism, the repetition compulsion of those four steps leading to the unlived life, that's humanity's fourth narcissistic injury. No one wants to hear about it. No one wants to know about it. <laughs> We're still trying to deal with the second, uh, sorry, with the third narcissistic injury, that the unconscious exists, that there is this stranger within, that there is this second self of the unconscious, the inner child of the past, that there is this um, 
feeling self that's in the bag, right? This double. That's that's the th humanity's third narcissistic narcissistic injury. So remember, the first was Copernicus. Uh, everything doesn't revolve around the Earth. The second was Darwin saying uh, we're part of nature, right? We can be traumatized. You know, animals can be traumatized too. You know, so we're part of nature. The third was that the existence of the unbewust, the unconscious, and uh, Lowell said it's man's evolutionary task to get to know the unconscious uh, history. And uh, the burglar comes along and come, uh, gives us humanity's fourth narcissistic injury, and we haven't fully dealt with the third yet. <laughs> Someone said that's why burglars work. Maybe it'll be more appreciated in the future or something. Okay, um, so he, he's relating it. So he's approaching developmental trauma. Yeah, he's focusing more on the developmental trauma of anxiety. Jackins is focusing more on the situational trauma. But you see, there's a, they cross-reference each other quite a bit. And in the past, that cross-referencing of the two was called the traumatic neurosis syndrome. We don't really have a phrase now, I don't think, to embrace the two. You know. Yeah, big topic. Yeah, uh, so the bottom line is anxiety is fear in the absence of a known cause. So anxieties, we're afraid and we don't know why. Okay, Burglar says it relates to those four steps. Another, another, one other author says it relates to the deep memory, unconscious memory of the mother threatening to abandon the child. If the child didn't do what the mother wanted, see the anxiety is there. We're, 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 but we're not aware of that. We're only aware of our defense mechanisms. And when we feel some anxiety, we think it's due to our defense mechanisms. That's misleading, Burglar says. The leading cause is the four steps or the abandonment depression threat by the mother early on or something else like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, this material, these quotes are... are helping to make us conscious uh, so that that taps into the to the quote interpretation is a bridge between the conscious and the unconscious right so we, we can partially heal by making ourselves conscious of what's going on getting to know what's in the bag or the dynamics of what's in the bag getting to know how the unconscious works right? someone called it the architecture of the sub subconscious or something like that Remember, to know thyself, we have to know both, the conscious and the unconscious. The self is the totality, the body-mind totality of the self and the unconscious. So when we say know thyself, we have to know the unconscious. And there is an unconscious. There is an unbewoosed. <laughs> unbewoosed. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. This has been... TQ 455 to 463, part 3 of 3. Parts 1 and 2 are posted as well. So thank you. Bye for now.